He may not be as famous as J. Robert Oppenheimer, but Enrico Fermi's experiments are what led to the creation of the atomic bomb. Growing up in Rome, his brightness caught the attention of his father's colleague, railway engineer Adolfo Amide, who guided him and taught him far more about math and physics than he was learning in high school. Had he not nurtured the 13-year-old Enrico, history may have turned out differently. By the time Enrico entered university in 1918 to study physics at the prestigious Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, there really wasn't anything more his professors could teach him, so he spent a lot of time studying quantum physics and relativity on his own. He was thoroughly impressed with Einstein's special theory of relativity, particularly his equation E equals mc squared, which shows that mass and energy are different forms of the same thing, and that a small amount of mass can be converted into a large amount of energy. As a student, he wrote, If we could liberate the energy in one gram of matter, we would get more energy than exerted by a thousand horses working continuously over three years. An explosion of such an awesome amount of energy would blow to pieces the physicist who had the misfortune of finding a way to produce it. These words were prophetic given his later work developing the deadliest weapon known to humankind. After studying in Pisa, he went off to the University of Göttingen in Germany, where the Italian was overlooked by his counterparts. Marie Curie apparently ignored him to the point of exceeding rudeness, according to a future colleague of his on the Manhattan Project to build the bomb. As he had done in Pisa, he focused on probability theory in Germany. His mastery of probability allowed him to make accurate predictions with minimal data, a vital piece in figuring out how to create the atomic bomb. According to biographer David Schwartz, Fermi's interest in probability theory may have been sparked by the death of his beloved brother Julio, who died during an operation on a throat abscess at just 15 years old. Schwartz surmises, Fermi may have taken away from this trauma the need to understand the likelihood of any particular event and a feeling that in understanding that probability, he was in a better position to anticipate it prepare for it, and perhaps even shape its outcome. His set of guidelines called Fermi-Dirac statistics, developed in tandem with English physicist Paul Dirac, rely on the use of probabilistic reasoning to predict the energy levels of particles called fermions. Imagine particles are concert goers and their energy levels are seats. Just as each person has a unique seat, each particle has a unique energy level. Just as no two people can share a seat, no two particles can share the same energy level. His development of Fermi-Dirac statistics propelled him from his job teaching at the University of Florence to a prestigious position at the University of Rome, where he became Italy's first professor of theoretical physics. He sought to establish Rome as a leading center of physics and was a natural leader others gravitated toward. In the Italian capital, he developed his explanation of beta decay, a process where unstable atoms break down and emit a specific type of radiation. Fermi proposed that inside these decaying atoms, one of the neutrons is turning into a proton. When this happens, the neutron releases an electron in a tiny, almost massless particle called a neutrino. Although this theory solidified his reputation as a leading physicist, it was his later experiments developing the atomic bomb that catapulted him into the limelight. He built on the work of Marie Curie and her husband Pierre, who discovered that bombarding substances with tiny particles called alpha particles could make them radioactive. Inspired by the Curies, Fermi did something similar using neutrons and discovered that certain elements bombarded with neutrons also become radioactive. Fermi thought he had created new elements. He even won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1938 for this discovery. But what he had actually done was split uranium atoms, a process that is fundamental to the making of an atomic bomb. He didn't realize it because he thought the nucleus of a uranium atom was like a solid brick wall, incapable of changing shape. It wasn't until German physicists replicated his experiments five years later that they made a monumental discovery. They realized firing neutrons at uranium splits the uranium atom, a process called nuclear fission. This releases an enormous amount of energy, which is fundamental to nuclear weapons. Fermi found out about his embarrassing overlook after he moved to America in 1939. Fascist Italy had become intolerable by then. Fermi had actually joined the fascist party earlier, as it was common for career advancement. However, as Hitler pressed Mussolini to target Italian Jews, there was fear that his wife, Laura, who was Jewish, would be persecuted. 
Another incentive to leave his homeland was that the physicist and politician Orso Mario Corbino, who had guided his career and opened doors for him, had died suddenly from pneumonia. After Corbino's death, funding for his research began to dry up. Fermi took the opportunity of collecting his Nobel Prize at the awards ceremony in Stockholm to then quietly head to New York with his wife and two young children, where a position awaited him at Columbia University. Two weeks after arriving in America on January 2, 1939, he learned about the major discovery of nuclear fission that he should have made. But there was no time to dwell on missed opportunities. And besides, the process of fission was not fully understood. He joined forces with another recent American immigrant, Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard, to understand and control each step of the chain reaction process. They aimed to harness the enormous amount of energy liberated within a fraction of a second, opening up the possibility that uranium could be used for power generation or, potentially, to build a bomb. They were aware of the implications of their work in light of the escalating tensions that would eventually lead to World War II and informed the U.S. Navy. The Dean of Graduate Studies at Columbia, George Pegram, sent a letter to Admiral Stanford Hooper outlining the potential consequences of Fermi's research. This might mean the possibility that uranium might be used as an explosive that would liberate a million times as much energy per pound as any known explosive. My own feeling is that the probabilities are against this, but my colleagues and I think the bare possibility should not be disregarded. The U.S. Navy gave Fermi a small $1,500 grant to continue his work. The government's interest in Fermi's research only intensified after Szilard wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, clearly spelling out that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may thus be constructed. He warned that Nazi Germany was demonstrating a keen interest in uranium research, hinting at their pursuit of a nuclear weapon. The most famous scientist in exile, Albert Einstein, signed the letter to give it extra clout. The U.S. government would eventually spend $2.2 billion to build the first atomic bomb. Scientists had to figure out how much uranium would be needed to create a bomb and how to assemble the bomb in such a way that it would explode properly. J. Robert Oppenheimer oversaw the Manhattan Project, coordinating the many teams who worked on different aspects of the bomb's development. The Manhattan Project was so secretive that most staff had no idea what they were working on. Fermi was primarily responsible for developing the first nuclear reactor, which demonstrated that a nuclear chain reaction could be initiated and controlled. By then, he had moved from Columbia to the University of Chicago at the request of the U.S. government, which wanted to consolidate all the nuclear research projects across the country. On December 2, 1942, he and his team conducted a nuclear experiment beneath the University of Chicago's abandoned football field in the squash court area. It was the only space with high enough ceilings to allow the construction of the pile of bricks of graphite and uranium, carefully arranged to facilitate a reaction. The graphite slowed down the speed of the neutrons so that they could cause further fissions. This atomic furnace, called Chicago Pile 1, demonstrated the first self-sustained chain reaction, ushering in the nuclear age. When Fermi realized the reaction was self-sustaining, quote, his whole face broke into a broad smile described David Schwartz in his biography on Fermi. A member of Fermi's team recorded the moment in a logbook, writing, we're cooking. The team shared a bottle of wine to mark the occasion, but they didn't make any toasts. This wasn't really a celebratory moment, as they knew the implications of what they had achieved. The Chicago pile was a predecessor to the giant nuclear reactors at Hanford, Washington. The US government acknowledges Fermi's pivotal role in creating the bomb declaring, more than any individual, he was responsible for developing a means for the controlled release of nuclear energy. Yet, Oppenheimer has gotten far more credit than Fermi. One reason is that Fermi rarely appeared on TV, and he wasn't into self-promotion, and he also passed away before television became widespread. On the other hand, Oppenheimer was often interviewed and photographed as the leader of the Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer recognized and acknowledged Fermi's contributions and intellect. At a dinner party after Fermi's death, Manhattan Project physicist Leonor Libby recalled that Oppenheimer suggested a game he called, Who Do You Want to Be on Your Day Off? And then he chose Fermi. In 1944, Fermi moved to Los Alamos, New Mexico, the main hub for the Manhattan Project, where he became an associate director. He served as an advisor, offering advice to other scientists when they ran into problems. On July 16, 1945, 
scientists detonated the first nuclear device near Alamogordo, New Mexico. Fermi made a rough calculation of its explosive energy by dropping small pieces of paper as the shockwave arrived and estimated from their deflection that the test had released energy equivalent to 10,000 tons of TNT. The actual result was more than twice that amount, 21,000 tons. This is enough to power 2 million American homes for a year. The Trinity device unleashed at Alamogordo had a plutonium core, which Fermi and his team achieved through a series of transformations with uranium that resulted in the creation of the human-made element. This design was later replicated in one of the two devastating bombs dropped on Japan. We don't know how Fermi reacted to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the hundreds of thousands of people who perished instantly or who later died from injuries and radiation sickness. He kept his emotions to himself. What we can glean is that during the development of the bomb, Oppenheimer recalled Fermi was surprised by the group's enthusiasm for building such a weapon and remarked, I believe our people actually want to make a bomb. Fermi's sister Maria did hold strong views and wrote to her brother, all, however, are perplexed and appalled by its dreadful effects, and with time, the bewilderment increases rather than diminishes. For my part, I recommended you to God, who alone can judge you morally. After the war, Fermi opposed working on the hydrogen bomb, which is orders of magnitude more powerful than the atomic bomb on moral and technical grounds, though he still contributed as consultant. The detonation of an atomic bomb by the Soviet Union in 1949 sparked Washington's interest in a more powerful weapon. Oppenheimer strongly resisted working on the hydrogen bomb and faced hearings that questioned his loyalty, suspecting him to be a Soviet spy. Despite Fermi and other scientists coming to his defense, Oppenheimer had his security clearance revoked. Fermi went on to become a distinguished professor of physics at the University of Chicago, where he was regarded as a superb teacher. During his later years, he raised an interesting question while lunching with colleagues. Where is everybody? He was asking why no extraterrestrial civilizations had been discovered, despite the great size and age of the universe. This is referred to as a Fermi paradox, because it's an apparent contradiction between the high probability of the existence of aliens due to the vast number of stars that can potentially host habitable planets, and the lack of human contact with such civilizations, or evidence for them. Fermi's view was that if intelligent life existed elsewhere in the universe, we should have been visited by them long ago. While Fermi contemplated the vastness of the universe, a more immediate personal concern soon cast a shadow over his life. His health had started to decline. In the summer of 1954, he was noticeably fatigued. He visited the doctor that fall, and they discovered he had stomach cancer that had metastasized. He was given six months to live. Throughout his career, Fermi was exposed to radioactive materials, which may have contributed to the development of his cancer. Fermi was not a religious person, but as he lay ill and dying, he received visits from priests. His Manhattan Project colleague, Leona Libby, who frequently went to see him, recalled, he spoke of his approaching death as a great experience, but he asked wistfully if I thought there was anything valid in the idea of an afterlife. He was really cross about dying, I came out after each visit and drove home with tears streaming down my face. His condition deteriorated rapidly. Two months after his diagnosis, on November 28, 1954, Enrico Fermi passed away at his home. He was 53 years old. In an obituary, the New York Times wrote, More than any other man of his time, Enrico Fermi could properly be named the father of the atomic bomb. Fermi's contributions touch our lives beyond the realm of physics. Tech companies are known to ask candidates complex problems during job interviews to see if they can emulate Fermi's way of thinking. An example of a Fermi problem would be estimating the number of piano tuners in a city like Toronto. Toronto has a population of approximately 3 million people. If we assume an average of 2.5 people per household, this gives us 1.2 million households. Let's say one out of 50 homes in Toronto has a piano. That means that there are 24,000 pianos in the city. They're usually tuned once a year, so there are 24,000 piano tunings required per year. Let's say a piano tuner takes two weeks of vacation a year, so they work 50 weeks a year. Let's say they tune two pianos a day times five days a week. That means that in one year, one piano tuner can tune 500 pianos. 
So if there are 24,000 tunings a year divided by 500 tunings per tuner, there is a need for 48 piano tuners in Toronto. It's this kind of curious mindset that Brilliant aims to cultivate in learners of all ages. I really enjoy Brilliant's logic puzzles that help sharpen my analytical thinking. Brilliant offers a hands-on, interactive approach for all of its science, technology, engineering, and math courses. My viewers really love Brilliant's computer science courses that can help you stay ahead in today's competitive marketplace. There's something for everyone, whether you're a beginner or you're interested in progressing through their more advanced courses. You can try out Brilliant for free for 30 days with my custom link, brilliant.org slash newsthink. The link is in my description. And the first 200 people who sign up with my custom link will get 20% off your premium subscription, which gives you access to all of the offerings. Thanks for watching. I'm Cindy Palm.